Yeah. Like, this is my third and final closing bell presentation uh, with you. And I'd like to just begin by saying that what I share today, I truly believe is a reflection of all of us working together to see our children succeed in PB. And so the reflections on the year are the efforts of more than 3,700 employees, parents like yourselves, and many, many others that find time in their schedules to volunteer and support kids and teachers and administrators. And so I really want to emphasize once again that I think that when we talk about some of the accomplishments, the highlights, and I will certainly identify some of the uh, challenges, ongoing challenges and, and things looking forward, you know, they are a reflection of our work together. This, both the successes and the challenges. And so that's how I'd like to begin. And so we'll start with some of the academic highlights because we want to celebrate our kids. We, when we talk about the strategic plan, the portrait of a graduate, and where we want to get kids to finish. And we are so excited that next week, a week from tomorrow, we're going to celebrate our graduates. How many parents do we have in here that have seniors? Seniors, congratulations to you. I didn't bring my tissues, but you know. Hang in there, it's a two shall pass, it's a good thing. Uh, we do have to learn to kind of kick them out of the nest, but thank you for helping us get this year's 2024 class to the finish line. Uh, and it's not closure, it's just the beginning of the next chapter. So there are some really, I think, important things that we uh, get to celebrate, because you know I do believe that a focus on student achievement is where we start, that's our, our vision and mission. And so there are 15 national merit semifinals, 34 commended students, uh, representing those uh, four comprehensive high schools. And these are just snapshots. These are certainly all of the celebration. But as you scan this list, you can see we've got uh, young emerging scientists and engineers that are winning at the state and national level. Um, we have uh, computing uh, students that are succeeding. We have DECA uh, leadership roles across the state. Some of the strongest DECA programs in the state reside right here in our district. Uh, we have uh, two students, as we do every year, uh, except prestigious military appointments, uh, West, Mac and, uh, West Point and the Naval Academy this year. And interestingly, we're actually starting a JROTC program for Army at North Canyon next year. Uh, so we're looking to see those opportunities for kids increase. We have three US, U.S. presidential scholars, a youth of the year through the Boys and Girls Club. That's a wonderful partnership, by the way, that we nurture. Uh, we have a host of state leadership conference winners and uh, City of Phoenix Outstanding Youth of the Year, a couple of them. So our kids are finding leadership roles uh, in and outside of the district. From our student experiences, you know, field trips, prom, assembly, sporting events, you know, we like to talk about taking all kids. We also like to talk about giving a very rich, robust, comprehensive experience. It's not just an academic track. There's opportunities for kids to find success, to find connections, to build memories in their schools in lots of different ways. Uh, and certainly volunteering is an important part, and our kids are great volunteers as well. We have uh, students who have succeeded in competitions for robotics, uh, more youth uh, leaders, and we did that twice, Skills USA gold winners, Winter Guard, uh, it was fun to see those kids uh, compete and win and, and then go on to a national competition in Ohio. We see Jazz State Band Championships occur, uh, French uh, Contest Gold winner, and then of course lots of uh, athletic uh, accomplishments as well, as state champions. And many of those you get to see if you tune into the boy meeting or you watch it at a later time. You know, this week, I think tomorrow night, we have some track, field, and tennis champions that will be recognized. And I hope they have a chance to attend. We kicked off our first inaugural flag girls play football season, which was amazing. Uh, it was one of my funnest PVB interviews, just doing that with them this year. Uh, out of the superintendent's office, you know, I think the leadership is critically important for providing not only the vision, but driving uh, their vision, mission, and values on a daily basis. We like to say in leadership that you know we have to build culture. We have to work at building culture every day. If you don't, it crumbles away quickly. And so making that commitment as a leader to uh, promote, to share, to inspire the vision and mission 
uh, to, to lead with the value statements in mind, to discuss our strategic goals and commitments at the forefront. I think we were really fortunate to work together as parents, as leaders in this district in developing a, a very rich and robust strategic plan. It really does drive our conversations every day. It drives our conversations in cabinet. It drives our conversations at principal meetings. And so it, it's important that we do continue to keep that in the forefront and it doesn't just become a document that goes on the shelf. Uh, and then we say, oh, it's been five years, let's revisit that. It needs to be a living, breathing document that influences our decisions. Uh, this year, uh, as we implemented the four district initiatives, district-wide initiatives, where, which were unique to PV because we haven't had those types of initiatives before. We've had a lot of autonomy at the building level. And to be able to uh, set the expectation on district-wide initiatives to use the strategic plan in, in guiding our resources to support those, both in terms of human and uh, capital investments, those four initiatives are best practices. They are frameworks uh, for helping our district get to the next level and be recognized um, as a destination of choice. We implemented the rubrics uh, last fall. We had our site leadership teams do some reflections on where are they at in terms of each of the initiatives and what is their plan over the next three years to get to a, the highest level of implementation. How do you get to a level of fidelity around STEAM, around professional learning communities, around multi-tiered system of supports, around PBIS? And so for us, it was I mean, an important first step and that will be another opportunity this year for our teams to reflect on how far did they come? Where did they have success? Where did they have challenge? And what we can do, what can we do to help them get to the next level? Um, our, from the office, you know, our PV Schools newsletter has been recognized as the state and national level. We're thrilled uh, with where we've come in the last three years in communications. What you might not know is that three years ago when I started, newsletter in this district was by subscription only. You signed up for it. It went to 5,000 people. It now goes to everybody. Right? It goes to everybody. And little things like that, you think, well, why wasn't that happening? Well, it, it's just it, it's what it was, right? You know, there were some concerns about FCC communications and, you know, bulk email and things like that. But we've got over those hurdles. And now um, we're thrilled that we have that availability to share information. Um, we have also a new and updated attendance notifications. Just rolled it out here in the last week. If you're somebody who received a notification for attendance, raise your hand in the last week. Did you like it? Uh, came right to your phone, right? Little notification, SMS. It's mm -hmm. terrific. And so we um, are the first in the country under final site to do that. We worked with them in developing that. They're our website and it's, it runs through our website. It integrates now with Canvas for the first uh, client to do that. And so we're really excited about that. And then out of the office, I do believe that, you know, we've really built up PVB. I've had a lot of positive comments uh, from people on that. And while we started a year and a half ago with an every other week opportunity, uh, this is now, we've got enough content that you can listen and, and tune in uh, every week uh, and, and get parts of it. And whether you're mowing the lawn, sitting by the pool, right, driving the car, you can tune in and listen and get lots of good information. From our elementary leadership team, Dr. Jarris and Dr. Corson, um, you know, it's important that when we take those initiatives and we work with the schools, on where you're at, how do you improve? Looking at your student achievement, what are the goals? Every school implemented a success plan. Every school. We also had every department, uh, whether it be HR or transportation, develop some uh, department success plans as well. We know that all schools implemented key components of our initiatives, MTSS, PLCs, STEAM, and PBIS. Our professional, we provide professional development for administrators, uh, included our administrative internship management program, those aspiring leaders, if you tuned into the last board meeting and we introduced uh, um, about a dozen new uh, graduates, is that right, Dr. Jarris, was there about a dozen? Uh, uh, 17 uh, of our <clears throat> aspiring administrators completed this year's AIM program. We provided PD for our new principals, uh, for first year principals. We want to date them with lots of information and support. We had the Principals Leadership Academy of Arizona. We had three first year principals participate in that. That was also highlighted on PVB. And the National Institute for Leaders, NISL, uh, for a cohort of 17 school and district leaders. So really excited about you know, our professional development to continue to support. We have to grow our own at all levels. We have where we, and we'll hear me talk a little bit later about certified and, and filling vacancies uh, in our Aspire program, but 
administrators are hard to come by too. And so we have to grow our own. We have to provide the right PD for them to succeed. 19 schools completed a PBIS, a team-based professional development this year. That's tier one and tier two. 10 schools. 10 schools were awarded state PBIS awards. So you can see, you know, we're <clears throat> really working hard to, to take that initiative district-wide at the highest level of uh, implementation. And even our Sun Kids Preschool program was identified in the Arizona Pyramid Model implementation site by ADE, only one of three uh, in the state. And so they're getting on board to do that as well. Student achievement, uh, this is not only a focus for the district, but it's been a focus in my personal goals. Uh, but student achievement focus this year was on early literacy, as well as seventh and eighth grade math, particularly the eligible one, two. Uh, we supported those initiatives district-wide with regional coaches. We had principals meetings that were focused on evidence-based practices. We had data guys uh, providing analysis, leadership, and support for your sport. And it might be noted that uh, you know Dr. Corson and, and his team, as well as some of our math specialists from curriculum, they're out in the trenches doing observations with principals. They're looking at you know best practices, coaching people uh, side by side, and uh, that uh, ear to ear, shoulder to shoulder experience to say, here's what you see, here's what you can do differently, here's how you might coach a teacher. We've got partnerships, uh, six schools this year Project uh, participated in Project Momentum to further enhance our curriculum. What you might not know about Project Momentum is that, you know, while it started under previous Governor Ducey as a, a funding mechanism to improve school achievement, it's been adopted by the Arizona Department of Education as, a, as their school improvement framework. It aligns very, very closely with our initiatives around a uh, multi-tiered system of support, support professional learning communities, that commitment for teachers to use data, to meet regularly, they get paid extra outside of their contract day to, to meet regularly, to talk about what can I do differently to improve my instruction and student outcomes. And we're excited that Project Momentum Arizona in our district will actually go to nine schools next year. And so that's really exciting. And it provides additional compensation to our teachers. Of course, we're very proud of our VIP program. Uh, we have more than 150 volunteers. Half of them are retired administrators from what I understand, but uh, this is an important part of our community. Our strategic plan talks about maximizing resources, optimizing resources, and our community is one of those resources. And you can see the thousands of hours that our volunteers have logged. They have provided training and support to, uh, to help our kids succeed. They've tutored more than a thousand pre-K2 kids. They've partnered with more than 180 teachers across our district. Uh, they have um, partnered with ASU Lodestar and AmeriCorps to recruit additional volunteers. They've mentored middle and high school students in the AVID program. They provided instruction for English language parents. Um, we know that the home is an important part of student success, and sometimes we need to provide that, uh, that support to the home as well, as well as support of the PB Family Resource Center by providing volunteers to implement many programs. So, this is a, a marvelous, marvelous addition to our district. We're really proud of the work that uh, Linda and Marisha do with all those volunteers. And we should continue to be very proud of their work. In assessment, we know that, uh, you know, sometimes just showing up is half the battle. Uh, and uh, in testing, we were really proud to see that 98.8% average participation rate district-wide for all of our state tests. Uh, including double ASA, Ozone Science, ACT, Aspire, and ACT, uh, which is a slight increase over participation from the year before. And we provided support to over 1,400 students and families through various college and career preparation events, which was over 150, 15 more students and families compared to last year. As a matter of fact, I just had a note this morning about FAFSA participation. It's been a huge effort statewide to increase the FAFSA participation. And we know that it's been a dip. And we have two out of the top 10 schools for the most FAFSA participation rates in the state. So kudos to uh, Melinda Villalobos and the team that have helped our counselors across the district engage parents and students uh, to, to fill out that. We also take the opportunity to have worked with uh, Helios and ASU to see that kids are getting uh, automatic enrollment letters to the three state universities. Uh, their admissions letter comes to them in the mail if you've got certain criteria. And we've now started conversations with uh, PBCC 
uh, as well as Maricopa County Community College District, but I think we're going to be able to make it happen sooner than later with PBCC so that kids can get an automatic admissions letter from PBCC too. And that sometimes that's all some of these kids need to know is that I, I, I qualify, I, I can go. And so then we can help figure out some of the financial challenges later. But we're working really hard to communicate. There is opportunity for additional education. And it doesn't have to be just an academic experience. We have lots of programs at the next level, uh, particularly through PDCC, uh, that are certification and credential programs as well. Our information technology team, uh, curricular focus, safe, responsible, respectful online behaviors. Uh, we know we have to not only try to protect kids physically on a campus, we have to try to protect them in the online world. And we can do that with decisions we make about around adopted curriculum, around resources and on online links, but we, that's not enough. We have to teach responsible behaviors because even good kids make bad choices sometimes, right? And so we have to teach them what does that mean and how are you creating a digital footprint? And so we have done an awful lot of work. We work with Common Sense Media. We provided some lessons by grade level to teach kids. It's tied to our uh, Positive Behavior Intervention Support Program, MTSS. We have taken to the next level. So if a child is engaged in appropriate online, we find a teachable way for them to learn from that. We can provide specific lessons and work with the student and the family. We partner with the Department of Homeland Security, the National Guard, and the U.S. Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. We are so blessed that we have those relationships. And we are very one of very few K-12 uh, school districts in the nation that have this level of engagement with agencies like this. And a lot of it's because of uh, Jeff Billings and his relationships over many, many years in the, in the state at those levels. So we're really blessed to have that available to us. And of course, AI, we've had to work on developing some artificial intelligence practices, and we've engaged that at our high schools as a little beta process, you know, teaching kids about the appropriate use of AI. Uh, it's an evolving um, technology, and it continues to blow me away every day. Uh, and I think it's a great tool. Uh, there's also a lot of things that scare me about it, but I think we have to embrace it and find ways to teach um, both adults and students about its advantages and disadvantages. And special education, another place near and dear to my heart, uh, our project search uh, success. You know, we have eight, roughly eight interns uh, a year, give or take uh, 10 this year. Um, that, uh, will be graduating and, and we're so happy that 100% of them move on to uh, successful employment uh, through this program, out of Hale Clinic. It's really quite impressive when you think about this special popula population of special kids that many times don't find employment after high school. And for them to be able to have this internship experience is, is huge. And we're looking at ways how we can expand some of our programs too. Um, it's also nice to be able to say that we've exited 266 kids from special education. And so when you look at, that's about 5% of our special education population that's exited from services. They've met the you know, uh, expectations and had the growth and demonstrated the ability now to get to a gen ed setting. We need to celebrate those kinds of things and such. Um, so that's a, that's a really positive thing. Gifted education. Uh, we're knocking it out of the park. We've had a great foundation with Dr. Gurias and Karen Brown has continued that leadership. And so we work really hard now to train 800 plus teachers in K-12 and strategies to support our twice exceptional kids. That's another population that is often under identified. And uh, yet we need to find ways to help kids who are both identified as gifted and identified with a special learning disability to succeed. And so helping our teachers in that professional development arena is powerful. We've increased gifted identification by 20% at our Title I schools through the use of local norming. This is really powerful, right? Because we have gifted kids at every school and we need to find avenues to challenge them with more rigor. And so by using local norming, we have that ability to identify those kids and give them uh, some more additional support. We also then hosted the very first annual gifted showcase. What a marvelous experience. How many had a chance to attend the gifted showcase this year? Anybody here? Two of us, two, thank you. It was great, wasn't it? A huge turnout. And to, to see our gifted specialists and, and such care, what's happening around the district, to be able to share with parents, 
And I think it was both a recruiting and retention strategy, uh, as well as being very informative. We also empowered 158 educators who visited our Center for Teacher Development. This is an opportunity for teachers to go through a classroom electronically to view, to listen, to see, to hear a master teacher at work. And so we might be in this classroom and I might use the technology to, on the screen to, to jump into our CTE classrooms and see what's happening. And then they don't know that we're there, right? And they know there's a camera in there and we've got all kinds of parent permissions and such, but these are master teachers. And then we can come back out and say, what did you hear? What did you see? How did they do this? See the best practice? It's a great, powerful strategy. And we use it for teachers, not just new teachers. We can use it for teachers who maybe been with us a long time, but they've changed grade levels or they changed departments. And they're like, I need some more help. I need some, I, I need more tools on my tool belt. And so this is a great thing that we've added. Uh, this is, includes 57 pre-service teachers from PVCC and ACU. We've increased uh, an increase of 130 visitors, which is included 29 pre-service teachers from the Eagle. We supported 178 teachers through our mentor program. Uh, we have about seven mentors in the district. Is that right? Seven mentors in the district, consulting teachers. Their, their full-time job is to see that we're near training our existing staff. We have to. Uh, because and so they have a pretty big load if you divide roughly 200 plus new hires every year by seven and that's their major emphasis right um and they you know there there is a lifeline they take calls at night they hand out tissues before school after school now uh, they're there in the classroom modeling for them uh sometimes helping them plan with their team uh and get and just whatever they need that's what they're there for so we're real excited to continue to, to provide our mentor support 1,500 observations, 2,100 visits. This is huge because our administrative teams are, you know, pretty thin. And, and so it's a huge task as an administrator to do the required walkthroughs, observations as part of the evaluation cycle. And we ask our administrators to do, um, you know, for new teachers, an observation and evaluation cycle each semester for the first three years. And then uh, even as an elementary principal, you might have up to words of, 30 to 40 or more direct reports. That's a lot of people to supervise, evaluate. And so to have our mentor teachers in a non-evaluative non way to be able to come in and provide some of that other kind of support, it, it's really powerful. Language acquisition this year um, has administered over 2,300 um, as, as Zella uh, assessments. And most of that's done between February and March. This is huge. How many Zella testers roughly? Well, they besides the sites, they do it in the sites, and then we have about four people who are on this thing to support those sites. And you know, we're addition those tests district wide, right? So it's important. Uh, we partnered with first and second year teachers, uh, ELD teachers, uh, to implement specific strategies to increase student proficiency on this level. A reassessment, and we need to do that, and uh, an increase of uh, 12 teachers over the last two. Fine arts. Another shiny moment for our district. We now have 85 students this year that will receive the Arizona SEAL on its proficiency. This is awesome. They'll have it on their diploma. Uh, this is an increase over last year's 76 SEALs. And uh, we've been awarded the Arizona Department of Education Arts Consumer for Grants. This was a little bit of a battle at the beginning of the year. We're thrilled that the governor's office came through to help see this come to fruition. And it provided $1,000 per fine arts teacher which is really valuable uh, when they have specific needs, whether it be sheet music or hands-on materials for their classrooms. And this was a heavy lift out of Jean's department. Kudos to Jean and her team for adoptions this year, for adoptions. We have curriculum adoptions typically on a seven-year cycle. Seven years is about, about, about the time it takes for that curriculum to kind of either be outdated, obsolete, or the licensure expires, and you need to go through the process to you know, select a new one and, and buy new licensure requirements. But reading, social studies, uh, ECAPS, this is the new so, uh, platform we talked about briefly for uh, our high schools, uh, the counselors to use with families uh, to track uh, their programs, supplemental resource lists. These are huge lists. And when you look at going into next year, it's just not the fact and the effort that it took from parents and teachers and 
and the district administrators to get these things adopted. Now we have to implement it. So now there's the, the training, it's the deliver the materials. Get, you know, are we getting all the reading and social studies teachers additions to teachers here this month before they leave? Are they signing up for uh, June and July trainings and August? And if they're a new hire late in, in the summer, you know, what do we have planned for the fall outside of the classroom day that they could still get the support? Because implementing it is a big, big lift on our teachers and our sites now. Uh, we may have done all the work to get it adopted, but it's just beginning for the site when it comes to implementing these. Aspire, I mentioned a little bit earlier about how we have to grow our own. And we're very proud that we've graduated our first class of eight candidates. We have three cohorts, correct? Uh, rolling right now. Yeah, so we've had, this was a special ed cohort that started. We started a second special ed cohort. We started a K-8 cohort. And these are people, right, that have a degree, but they have aspirations to be a teacher. So they come to our program. It's a state approved program. They start in the classroom because they've come to us with related experiences. They've demonstrated success. Maybe they came out of a support role, like an ESP role, classroom aid. Some of them, right, have related experiences in the private sector teaching and supporting, but we don't have necessarily their credentials. They enroll in our program and over the next two years, they have monthly PD taught by our people with our curriculum and over two years, they finish with a master's degree, their full certifications, and it didn't cost them anything. This is huge. And uh, so we're very, very proud of that. And our next two cohorts are a little bit larger than the eight, I think. Uh, you know uh, the numbers? And well, the current cohort is uh, 21. 21. Uh, and that's the low program. Okay. And then we're building the core line right now. And mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody that's interested, you know, uh, you know, want to give up the time to go to school. They want to start teaching right away. They think they can be successful. We've got the program and the supports. They can help them. And uh, we're really proud of that program. And that is part about recruiting teachers and retaining them. Um, people that have tremendous skills in our community. A DPS, uh, safety portal. This is established process to take advantage of the new DPS portal. Uh, we jumped on it as quickly as we could. This reduces time for those of you that may recall, if you ever gone through the process to be fingerprinted, uh, generally it took six to eight weeks, sometimes longer to get your fingerprint clearance to come in and start as an employee. This new digital scan uh, has reduced that significantly. Um, sometimes it's as low as three or four days. Sometimes it takes a little longer. I know we, it's not as good for some people who are in the healthcare industry, as I understand, who wash their hands very frequently and uh, they don't have prints to give. So sometimes it takes a little bit longer and sometimes there's bumps, but we're so happy with the majority of people who now can get um, their DBS, their uh, increase. And, and it gives us results much quicker uh, in terms of uh, making sure that people that we hire are safe for kids. Asper Academy, this is a proud moment for HR. They always like to keep training. We uh, have new employees, uh, just like there's turnover at the building level in terms of teachers and sports centers, there's turnover at the district level too. So this is an example of training some of our tech twos in, in HR uh, as well. School closure, never an easy topic. You know, it was a difficult year to talk about school closure. Closing three schools is a heavy lift. Um, but, you know, when we look at the opportunities to to honor our commitment, which was no one's ripped, no one's laid off. We honored that. We placed 125 teachers in all 55 ESPs. Now I have a couple of principals on temporary assignments. And we'll find a, they've got a got, got a home for next year, but everyone has a job. I think that's a tremendous accomplishment to our district to be able to do that. It took a lot of great people working together to make it happen. So, uh, Mark. Huh? Uh, our marketing communications effort, we've maintained over 9,500 pages of content. 40 to 50% of those are translated uh, into Spanish. We've got a couple of translators that help make that happen, as well as uh, AI that, that supports that. But, you know, we're continuing to improve the user experience. They, they run data to know if you, we see a trend of people and using find it fast, right? And they're all, and we see a trend of that's, See, if we were always looking for that, well, then we know we have to move it up on the website. We have to find a different place to do it. So we're trying to use data to make sure that the user experience is improved. 
We've been very busy. This is 2.3 plus million messages today. What, what, what's the start date, Matt? Uh, that is about a year and a half. About a year and a half uh, messages sent out uh, with transition, as I mentioned, to the new attendance platform. 2.3 million Facebook impressions over 89,000 Twitter impressions, and we've reached over 76,000 accounts through Instagram. Matt, since when? August 1st. Since August 1st. I can tell you that's very different than three years ago when I think he and I were talking about impressions uh, and the district's marketing efforts, right? And, and having a social media. Link. And if you watch social media and you subscribe to our Facebook page, you saw my attempt last Friday to post. How many saw it? One, two, three. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jarris. All right. <laughs> I had to uh, bribe the Marcon team for the keys to the account. I gave them the crumble cookies uh, and I did my best, but we had fun. So if you don't know, you'll have to go to look it out. <laughs> and then they've also completed over 750 marketing and communication projects uh, this year. Our business operation team, busy, busy, busy. Um, the department developed a district-wide focus on communications and professionalism. I can tell you time and time again, the number of comments I have had from district administrators and principals, primarily principals, uh, with the effort out of uh, Dr. Davis's office. They're so pleased with his communication effort uh, and teachers too. Uh, they've been more responsive about work orders and information about the status of a work order. So uh, we, Obviously, can continue to improve in that area, but we're so excited about how far that's come so short. They closed over 22,000 work orders uh, this year. Uh, they completed $28 million in projects for the summer of 23, and then $42 million in projects in fiscal year 24 to date. Uh, obviously, we have to thank our community for supporting uh, the bond override for these projects that even happen. Uh, and then, obviously, we're also working to try to um, save money for the district. And so we do a schools, facilities, uh, division applications for building renewal grants. The SFD has awarded us uh, over $800,000. And if those grants had not been awarded, we would have had to use either m &O or bond dollars to make those things happen. So we're real excited that we are also taking the efforts to write for grant dollars to offset costs. Our finance and payroll, obviously we want to be fiscally uh, responsible. And so we're thrilled that we continue to see no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in our audits. We have both internal and external audits as well as state audits. And uh, so if you look at the USFR components questionnaire, there's 171 of those questions. And so we're at 97% on five of those questions that uh, were listed as no. So terrific, kudos to our finance and payroll department for uh, the compliance and efforts to keep us fiscally responsible. Our payroll finance and HR office always have to work over the last several years every January to implement the new minimum wage because it goes up in January. Our budgets start July 1st, but we have to plan for and implement those on a January 1st basis. And next year, our minimum wage is going to go up to, you know, the number offhand, either one of you? Oh, August when we get the Fourteen eighty-five. Yeah, if it was today's numbers, and remind me again to the to the district budget, we had to put aside how much for that to about one hundred sixty thousand dollars for January's increases uh, for the new minimal wage such. So, well, mid-year task, but it takes these departments working together to make it happen. So, kudos. Nutrition and wellness. Yes. When I talk about us serving all students, we serve all kids. And we serve kids who would not have a lunch if they didn't come to us. Um, 9,500 lunches and over 2,500 breakfasts every day across this district. We continue to work on recruitment and retention. The Nutrition and Wellness Department has had an improvement. You can see that while they still have 15 open positions, that's down from 25 a year ago. So we've had some success uh, filling some positions there. They plan staffing allocations for 24 or 25 based on the school closures, student relocations. They successfully placed nutrition and wellness staff. So nobody lost a job as well in this department. 
Um, and then we've also submitted and identified student enrollment data to the Arizona Department of Education's Health and Nutrition Services team for their annual publication uh, notification. And then we're reviewing the site qualification for community eligibility provision. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for us to take 10 schools and provide school-wide breakfasts and lunches. Uh, so we're really excited about this opportunity here. So thank you to Camille and her team out there in nutrition. Purchasing, I made transition to a completely automated system. Woohoo! <laughs> it's always nice when we can uh, get over some of those implementation uh, challenges, right? No more paper files. E procurement is the new way to shop. Uh, these number of suppliers currently equipped with e shopping portals, keeps growing, and purchasing will continue to add more as they become available. They've facilitated the issuance and award of over 15 new contracts. So we don't just use the same people over and over. We're always working to add to that opportunity for community vendors and partners to uh, to join uh, this uh, this district through a new contract to provide services that include commodities, banking, educational field trips, and facilities-related services. We've also approved and distributed over 10,000 purchase orders district-wide uh, this year and registered over 500 new vendors. I think that's really powerful for our community here and see. There is opportunity for you to do business with the district. Transportation, this is still a challenge and yeah, opportunities, you know, to improve. So we've covered all our ops despite being 61 drivers short out of 110. This is, you know, and we've raised the starting dollar rate to 19, $19 an hour, roughly, yeah. roughly. And so, you know, this is a challenge and I think that it's important. They're still doing double, triple routes. I know I still hear from parents that are frustrated with 40 minutes late on each end of the day. I get it, but I'd rather have them 40 minutes late than never, right? And so there's gives and takes. Um, we have our um, office staff, clerks, techs, um, dispatchers filling in to drive. And so sometimes you can't get a hold of somebody. It's a good chance they're out driving a bus. Um, we have you know less than half of the bus aids that we need. Uh, so they're also doing double routes. We transported, this is interesting, even though we only have what 45% of our drivers necessary, we still provided 1,472 field trips. 1,470. Those are our drivers, our buses. That's not contract. That doesn't count that number. Um, the average driver works 50 plus hours a week. Many of them don't want to, but they're continuing to do it because they know we need it. So we continue to look for new drivers. And it's, it's not, not necessarily easy to become one. And once again, this is an environment that they can make a lot more money. And we have three or four a year that probably go through our program, get the free training, and, and then move on to bigger, better things. But we still got to do what we can. We've driven over a million miles to date. That's a lot of miles. A lot of miles on the buses, right? A lot of miles. And we're the only district in the surrounding area that hasn't eliminated any routes. This Maybe is it, you know, maybe it's a time that we have to revisit that. But once again, we're looking for efficiencies. I know that uh, Brandon George, a director, will work with Jill uh, Berrigan, our assistant too. They'll talk about some ways they can make things more efficient. Can we eliminate routes, make kids maybe walk a little bit farther than the next route? Can we shorten up? So they're always looking for things like that. Um, but we still have a commitment to provide all the routes, you know. Maybe there's a conversation, and I think it's shooting ourselves in the foot, but maybe it's a conversation about do we change the distance from school that kids, you know, qualify for bus transportation. Other districts have had those conversations. They're painful uh, because I don't know that, you know, at a mile, I want uh, more than a mile, I would want a child walking in grades K through six to school. You know, um, we have to consider how busy are the streets do they have to cross, right? And so all those things are things that we think about and consider not only when we're talking about transportation routes, but attendance boundaries, school closures, all those things have a powerful impact on providing services to all kids. And of course, we're looking forward. Um, well, you blessed me with the opportunity to serve this district for 25 years and the last year as a superintendent. Good things are yet to happen. And things will happen because we have a tremendous community of parents, teachers, support staff, and administrators working together. This is paradise for many things. We're not perfect. We have opportunities to continue to improve. 
We're already, already working on sh uh, transition plans uh, to support new leadership. Dr. Reynolds is here to uh, listening in today. Uh, Dr. Lindsay has already started in her transition with Dr. Corson as a member of our cabinet. We have four new directors. We have several new principals. There's lots of new people uh, going to be across the district. So it's a constant evolution of training, support, making sure that people understand the culture, the systems, the procedures that we have in place to make this special. But I can guarantee you that we're being very intentional about providing the supports and transition leadership so that the ball isn't dropped uh, at any level. We continue to focus on teaching and learning. I think that's our mission, right? Let's focus on teaching and learning and helping our kids succeed as measured by some student outcome. And it's not just one test score. I get that, right? There's lots of ways we can measure student achievement and we continue to do that and we should. We're gonna build upon our stakeholder relationships uh, to implement the strategic plan. And just as you know, as part of the transition, stakeholder leaders from all of our employee groups and parent groups, present and future, Julie, Jessica, we had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Reynolds. That communication is already building and growing. So that is an important opportunity for us to continue to increase the voice and input from our community. Those are the highlights for this year that I, once again, would say reflect the efforts of all of us. Um, the, the student success is what helps us uh, wake up every day to decide to do the best we can for our kids, uh, to make it a safe learning environment, a very great place to work, uh, to learn, to play. And so, as superintendent, I'm proud to have served, and I thank you so much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I need to drink water. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I've got a question, mind or comment about the VIP. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing in the pods for Paradise. And Paradise, so whoever did that, thank you. I think that organically came from the VIP folks. So one of the uh, most rewarding things I've ever done. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you for that. Yes, Deb. You have to add two sports accomplishments. We just had softball banquet last night. Seneca won um six A regional champs in Bergen State. With multiple players recognized with honors and a coach, I think was the division coach of the year. I think he was AI coach of the year yeah. for, for 6A. Yeah. And they have not. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> awesome. Can we have Dr. Reynolds just? Sure, Dr. Reynolds, say hi. Yeah. Yeah. People are come on up here because on X, X marks the spot. There's people, people on there's people online, Dr. Reynolds. There's people <laughs> online. <laughs> we didn't mean to put you on the spot literally, but um, just so that people can see your face and welcome you again. Good job, good job. Uh, exhausting. Right, looking at, at all the work that it, it unless you've been. Retired for a year, <laughs> and now you look and go, oh my gosh, you got a lot. Of and I think that that's really important. Uh, as Dr. Bales uh, heads off into greener pastures, the sunset—I don't know, whatever, whatever metaphor uh, is appropriate. But you know, when you look and and you saw Troy uh, break those things down by department, you saw him break them down by um, uh, groups that are our cabinet supports. One of the things that you learn, we talked about this this, this morning, is uh, how big the job is of public school superintendent. And uh, the work that Troy has done to transition us forward is exciting. It makes it easy for me to, to be able to come in and support the district. Uh, for those of you, it's it's I see so many friendly faces. Um, from the past, uh, but I was spent 22 years here in Paradise Valley. Uh, the last, I spent four years in Peoria Unified, I uh, was superintendent there. And it's just super exciting to be able to come back uh, and support this district. I am a parent in this district. So for the past uh, five years, I have put on a kind of a new hat in PV, a uh, daughter who graduated in 20. Two sophomore in college, yeah. 22. Uh, and then my son Declan is a sophomore at Pinnacle. So uh, excited to come back and, and uh, assume this, this new role. Troy has been an amazing partner over the last uh, few months, uh, making sure that I have information, making sure that we're able to make this transition really smooth. And, and one of the exciting things, and I, I mentioned this uh, to the to somebody we met with uh, <laughs> over the last few weeks, 
it is also really, really interesting to step away and see how things are done so, uh, elsewhere uh, and the good and the, and the less good, uh, and then to be able to come back and really bring that as uh, uh, a benefit to, to the district. And one of the amazing things that, uh, that PV has is you, UPC. Uh, this is not, it's not like this everywhere else. Uh, and so the role that you play in supporting our students, our teachers, the entire district is just really, really incredible. And I'm excited to be part of that again. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll go back to my chair. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Just, just want to thank you again. Thank you to cabinet. Um, for making yourselves available for all of our general meetings on Wednesdays. We appreciate you taking the time for that, the time to answer questions and hear feedback from parents as well. Um, as Dr. Reynolds said, we understand how unique this is and the opportunity that we have as parents to collaborate with the district, and we appreciate that. And thank you again for all your service. For your I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>